On glossy brochures, these outboards promised revolution, but what they delivered was chaos. Engines ripped off transoms at speed, fuel systems that burst into flames, wiring that left entire boats stranded and silent in open water. The shocking truth. Behind the most dangerous outboards ever built isn't just about broken promises. It's about real lives put at risk by engineers chasing horsepower and corporations hiding disaster. Hundreds of documented failures, lawsuits, and recalls were only the beginning. Which engines earned their deadly reputation? And why did so many of these ticking time bombs ever make it off the factory floor? The answers lie beneath the surface, and what's uncovered next will change how you ever see outboards again. Horsepower was the obsession. By the late 1960s, outboard makers were locked in a race to claim the fastest, most powerful engine on the water. Mercury, Johnson, and Chrysler each promised more speed, lighter weight, and new technology with every model year. Boating magazines ran full-page spreads boasting 100 horsepower milestones and acceleration figures that made family runabouts sound like offshore racers. Sales soared as two-stroke engines grew bigger and bolder, with manufacturers pushing past old limits on displacement and RPM. The message was clear. More power meant more prestige, and buyers lined up for the latest upgrade. But the push for speed came at a cost. Engineering teams, under pressure from executives and marketing departments, cut corners to beat the next big launch. Lightweight alloys replaced tried and true steel, sometimes before the metallurgy was ready. Gear cases were slimmed down to shave pounds, ignoring the stress of higher torque at full throttle. Cooling systems designed for smaller engines were reused on bigger blocks, leaving pistons to cook in their own heat during hard runs. The faster the sales numbers climbed, the less time there was for real-world testing or durability checks. By the 1970s, the outboard market was flush with models boasting 100, 115, even 135 horsepower. Chrysler's own 105 and 135 horsepower engines hit the market with fanfare, promising a revolution in family boating. Mercury's Tower of Power and Johnson's V4s followed each claiming the crown for speed and innovation. Behind the scenes, engineers warned about overstressed mounts and unproven new parts, but the pressure to deliver was relentless. Every year brought another leap in claim performance, while safety and reliability quietly slipped further down the priority list. Consumer demand fueled the fire. Boat buyers wanted the latest tech, the biggest numbers, and the promise of effortless speed. Dealers moved inventory by stoking the arms race, offering trade-in deals and financing to keep the cycle spinning. The industry's appetite for innovation outpaced its caution, and the cracks began to show. Warranty claims rose. Mechanics struggled to keep up with a flood of new designs and unfamiliar problems. But as long as the horsepower wars brought buyers through the door, few in the boardroom asked tough questions about what might go wrong at the edge of the envelope. The result was a decade defined by risk, engines that looked like the future but sometimes acted like loaded guns. The drive for power and market share set the stage for a wave of catastrophic failures, lawsuits, and corporate disasters that would haunt the industry for years to come. Chrysler's 105 and 135 horsepower outboards looked like the future, sleek, powerful, and ready to turn any family boat into a speed machine. But beneath the polished cowling lurked a flaw that would haunt the brand forever. The problem started at the transom. Chrysler's engineers, in a rush to cut weight and cost, used thin alloy castings and undersized bearings right where the engine met the boat. At idle, things felt solid. But open the throttle, and every vibration, every wave, sent shock through a mountain system that just wasn't up to the job. It didn't take long for the cracks to appear, literally. Mechanics began finding hairline fractures around the transom bracket and mounting bolts. Some owners chalked it up to rough water or bad luck, but then engines started letting go at speed. 
One minute, a family was cruising across the lake. The next, the entire outboard tore free, ripping off the transom and plunging into the water behind them. In the worst cases, the force of the failure sent fiberglass splinters flying and left gaping holes where the engine had been bolted just moments before. Independent marine mechanics sounded the alarm. John Tiger Jr., a respected outboard specialist, documented repeated cases of Chrysler 105s and 135s snapping off under stress. He filed reports and wrote warnings in trade magazines, describing the mounting system as a ticking time bomb. But Chrysler's official response was silence. Warranty claims piled up, but the company downplayed the risk, blaming owner misuse and offering quiet repairs instead of recalls. By the mid-1970s, stories of catastrophic detachments circulated through boating circles and repair shops. Lawsuits followed. One legal filing described a high-speed failure that left a family stranded, their boat half-sunk, engine lost in the depths. The technical autopsies all pointed to the same cause. Brittle alloys around the transom clamp, stress fractures radiating from bolt holes and bearings too small for the engine's weight and torque. Mechanics who tried to reinforce the mounts with aftermarket parts found limited success. The underlying metal was simply too weak. Chrysler's reputation never recovered. Dealers dropped the line and the brand's marine division collapsed under the weight of lawsuits and lost trust. The 105 and 135 became cautionary tales, proof that chasing horsepower without testing for real-world stress can turn a family out and into a disaster. For those who ignored the warnings, the risk wasn't just mechanical. It was personal, and sometimes it was life-threatening. Feist was supposed to be the breakthrough, in 1997, Evan Rood's engineers rolled out a new breed of direct injection two-stroke, promising cleaner emissions and more power with less fuel. But inside every Feached engine, a hidden danger lurked. The high-pressure fuel injectors designed for precision wore out fast. At the heart of the problem was the injector armature, meant to open and close with each pulse, grinding itself down after just a few dozen hours on the water. When the seal failed, raw gasoline sprayed inside the engine cowl, pooling around hot wires and ignition coils. It didn't take long for disaster to strike. Coast Guard reports from 1998 and 1999 describe boats going silent, then filling with smoke, then erupting in open flames. One survivor recalled the moment. Sudden silence, then smoke, then fire. Total panic. We barely got a call out before it went up. Mechanics started calling the fish the grenade, not because it broke down, but because when it failed, it often exploded. Fires weren't rare. They were routine. Some boats burned to the waterline before help arrived. Evan Rood's own engineers grew anxious. Field reports piled up, each describing the same sequence. Failed injector, fuel leak, ignition, fire. Coast Guard advisories warned owners to stop using affected models immediately. But inside OMC, the story was different. Management was split. Some pushed for a recall. Others insisted the problem was overblown, worried about the cost and the brand's reputation. Internal memos, later cited in lawsuits, showed a trail of warnings, but public statements downplayed the risk. Dealers were told to fix engines quietly, replacing injectors and rewiring burnt harnesses without drawing attention. By the time the Fick disaster peaked, dozens of documented fires had left boats destroyed and owners shaken. The technology that was supposed to save Evinrude nearly killed the company. For those who lived through a Fick fire, the memory is simple. One spark and everything changed. A well-maintained outboard, fresh from winter storage, hums to life on the first pool. Confidence builds with every smooth idol. Yet beneath the polished exterior, history tells a different story. Trusted brands have released engines that, despite passing every pre-trip check, left families adrift as dusk settled and cell signals faded. Some failures began as a sputter, a faint whiff of gasoline, 
a vibration that grew into panic as flames licked fiberglass and smoke billowed across open water. Hulls gutted in minutes, cherished boats reduced to charred frames. In other cases, the danger was silent, mounts weakened by years of vibration, bolts sheared by hidden corrosion, fuel lines routed too close to hot manifolds. The worst offenders remain out there, quietly changing hands, their reputations scrubbed clean by a fresh coat of paint and a well-rehearsed sales pitch. Online marketplaces are filled with tempting bargains, each listing promising reliability and adventure. Yet a gleaming cowl can't conceal a flaw engineered into the heart of the motor. Mechanics recognize the warning signs, a telltale crack near the lower unit, a faint odor of gas after a hard run, a mounting bracket that flexes under load. Sellers, eager to close the deal, rarely mention the history of snapped mounts or recall notices quietly issued years ago. A low price on a classified ad may come with a hidden cost, a mayday call at midnight, miles from the nearest dock. These aren't isolated breakdowns. Some engines failed so catastrophically that they triggered recalls, lawsuits, and the collapse of storied brands. The next chapter reveals what manufacturers tried to keep from public view. Internal memos, Coast Guard warnings, survivor testimonies that never made the brochures. The evidence is damning, the consequences real. For those who believe the worst is behind them, the story is far from over. Serial numbers still match those on recall lists. Owners who think their engines are immune may discover otherwise. Safety in this world is never guaranteed. The real bombshells are still ahead. Mercury's Black Max V6 promised muscle and speed, but what it delivered was something far more unpredictable. Owners called it the Blackout King. The trouble started deep inside the ignition system. At high RPM, brittle wires and weak switch boxes could lose contact without warning. One moment, the engine roared across open water, the next, total silence. Offshore boaters reported the same nightmare, full throttle, then an instant loss of spark. No warning, no sputter, just dead in the water, sometimes miles from shore. The electronic timing advance, meant to squeeze out extra power, became a liability. If it failed, the engine could fire at the wrong moment detonating pistons or snapping crankshafts. Mechanics found melted spark plug boots and scorched wiring looms, all symptoms of a system not built for sustained speed. Some failures left only a faint electrical smell and a useless kill switch. Others forced frantic mayday calls as boats drifted into shipping lanes or breaking surf. Coast Guard rescue logs from the late 1970s and early 1980s show a spike in stranded boaters running Black Max engines. The common thread was electrical silence, ignition blackouts that turned routine trips into emergencies. Even after Mercury issued incremental fixes, the reputation stuck. Forums filled with stories of night fishing trips cut short, tournaments lost, families left to paddle home under fading light. Unlike the fiery chaos of a fuel explosion, the Black Max's danger was quiet and absolute. No flames, no smoke, just the sudden betrayal of an engine that looked perfect one minute and abandoned you the next. For many, that silent failure was the most terrifying risk of all. Yamaha's HPDI 300 arrived in the mid-2000s, promising high-pressure direct injection and class-leading speed. But inside the lower unit, a silent weakness waited for the right stress. Metallurgists hired by insurance companies found the fault after boats lost power at speed. Gear cases cracked open along sharp corners, spots where reinforcing metal had been trimmed to save cost and weight. The cracks always started at the same place, a thin seam near the bearing carrier, right where torque loads peaked at wide open throttle. Forensic teardown reports from 2004 to 2006 showed fatigue lines snaking through the alloy, ending in a jagged break. Independent technicians traced the problem to a rushed production run, where quality checks missed microscopic flaws in the casting. 
Some failures happened at speed, leaving boats dead in the water, unable to steer or make headway. Yamaha updated the design, but the damage was done. For owners, a hidden crack meant the difference between a safe trip home and a mayday call offshore. Honda's early BF-15 looked harmless, just 15 horsepower, compact, and quiet enough for a Sunday on the lake. But for small boat owners, this engine carried a hidden threat. The trouble started with vibration. Honda's mount design failed to account for the natural resonance of lightweight hulls. At certain RPM, the engine's pulse matched the frequency of the boat's transom, turning a gentle hum into a destructive shake. Owners reported cracks spidering out from mounting bolts, gel coat chipping away, and in some cases, the entire transom flexing with each burst of throttle. Mechanics found splintered wood and fractured fiberglass on boats that had never seen rough water. The problem wasn't power, it was physics. Even at low speeds, the mismatch between engine and hull could turn a calm ride into a repair bill. For families who bought the BF-15 for reliability, the surprise wasn't a breakdown at sea, but real structural damage before they'd even burned through a full tank of gas. Dealer logs told the real story. Engines that failed under warranty weren't sent back for analysis. They were swapped out quietly, no questions asked. Service managers received shipment after shipment of replacement power heads, each one tagged for a boat that had lost power or seized mid-run. Internal memos, stamped confidential, directed dealers to handle repairs off the books and reassure owners that failures were rare. One directive, circulated in 1998, instructed staff to replace defective units discreetly and avoid discussing patterns with customers. Cost-benefit spreadsheets estimated payouts for silent fixes against the risk of a headline-grabbing recall. Distribution lists for these memos stretched from factory floor supervisors up to regional sales directors. Mechanics who pushed for answers found their questions buried under paperwork or ignored by upper management. The result? A paper trail of deliberate silence. For every catastrophic breakdown, there was a calculated decision to keep the truth locked away. Profit over safety, reputation over responsibility. Between 1975 and 2006, documented failures in outboard engines from Chrysler's 105 and 135 structural detachments to OMC's Fischt fires and Yamaha HPD I gear case cracks resulted in recalls, lawsuits, and thousands of warranty claims. Evidence from Coast Guard advisories, forensic teardowns, and leaked internal memos confirms that manufacturers often prioritized horsepower and market share over safety. Still, not all corporate documents have been made public, and the true number of affected boats remains uncertain. The confidential directive uncovered in Section 3 shows that some companies chose silent repairs over open warnings. Today, stricter safety standards exist, but the legacy of these failures continues to shape how engines are built, sold, and serviced. The facts uncovered here make one thing clear. Every shortcut taken in pursuit of innovation left a mark on the water, in the archives, and in the lives of those who trusted the machines.